and, and we thought uh, it would be of uh, particular interest to you. So, uh, uh, so Juan Manuel and I have been friends for uh, quite some time, and you give some type of a comparison of what went on with Team USA and Team Qatar. Uh, and so uh, uh, we've had our introduction, so you know who we are. Uh, in terms of our disclosures, uh, no disclosures. No disclosures. No disclosures Nothing for me. Uh, I do want to make sure that, uh, as you know, we've liberally borrowed a few videos uh, uh, from uh, NBC, World Media, those types of things. We went, those are given to us by courtesy for academic purposes only. So we are uh, running a kind of Olympia trivia contest uh, with question and answer. And we want you all to participate. So we will distribute a form. So please select the answer that you feel that is the correct one. And at the end of the presentation, we will see whether you are right or wrong. So um, please, Mark, tell us, what is the path that uh, a team physician or a sport medicine physician or an orthopedic surgeon has to go through to become a member of the Team USA? Uh, well, for Team USA, I think there's a variety of different potential uh, pathways. Uh, you can go through the United States Olympic Committee. Uh, you can actually volunteer and work with a national governing body. Uh, uh, an example would be uh, USA Gymnastics. Uh, you could actually volunteer as a host country uh, 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 doctor. So my good friend Bill Briner was uh, one of the poly polyclinic doctors. Uh, you could serve as an adopted country doctor. Another good friend served for China. Uh, you could actually, one of the interesting ways, it's the only way to go to the Olympic Games is you can buy your way in if you own a horse uh, because the owner gets to go also. And then uh, you can actually work through uh, the, the formal medical team itself. My path started about 25 years ago. Uh, I worked through five different national governing bodies. I went to every IOC World Congress on Sports Sciences. Uh, I've been to the Paralympic Games, Pan American Games, two World University Games, and then really my penultimate experience was at, the, at, this, at these Olympic Games. For the Team USA, it's a very unique uh, 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 collective group. And certainly the group is the key of what we do. It's, it's, there's no I in team. So it's not about me, it's about team play. And the team play includes primary care doctors, chiropractors, which is a little unusual, I think, for some other countries, athletic training, massage therapists, orthopedics, physical therapy, administration. One of my favorite stories is actually an athlete who came in with neck pain. I evaluated him. I'm going to give him some medicines, maybe. I have my chiropractic uh, buddy evaluate him. He manipulates him. Therapy does some uh, soft tissue releases. Athletic training uh, 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 did some education for exercise, and the athlete went on to win a medal. For Team USA, 550 total athletes covering 30 different sports. The total uh, contingent from Team USA is about 1,200 people, so this is the lives we took care of. Total healthcare staff, uh, uh, including national governing body doctors, was over 100, and currently they're therapists, athletic trainers, doctors. For the USOC, which is really what I did, it's an umbrella team, was really, uh, a, they took care of the entire team and oversight, oversaw everything. One internist, three orthopedic surgeons, four chiropractors, physical therapists, athletic trainers, and massage therapists. We provided over 5,000 treatments at a value of over half a million dollars. Juan Manuel, how about, how about Qatar? Well, Qatar has a much more humble team. We had only 36 athletes and 50 officials, so altogether 80 something, so it was much less big. Uh, the pathway to come member or to be the chief medical officer was a little bit of a discussion between the Qatar Olympic Committee and ASPETAR. Qatar Olympic Committee requested ASPETAR to provide uh, one chief medical officer, and after some discussion, mainly between uh, upper management, uh, director general, chief medical officer, they thought that it could be a good one to go. I don't know why, but I can imagine. So I have been in seven Olympics, including Rio. I started in Barcelona in 1992 when I was a volunteer as host uh, organizer and I was the doping officer in athletics and swimming and then have been three times uh, athletics, Spanish athletics team physician in Atlanta, in Sydney, in Athens, and then I became more kind of VIP, going to luxurious hotels, things like that. And I was big, <laughs> the medical delegate for AAAF, both in Beijing and London. So then I came uh, also uh, now kind of uh, adopted guy in Qatar, and it was my pleasure. Also, I had contributed uh, heavily with IOC as the, the injury and illness or violence teams. And I also would play that role in 2016 now in Rio. 
So I think that the most important thing is to have experience as team physician. I have been uh, working in the Spanish Athletics Federation, as you probably know, for uh, almost 17 years. So I went to nine uh, World Athletic Championships, many European Cups, European Championships, and that uh, provided me a very good uh, clinical experience in big competitions. But you have to prepare yourself, you have to do really research, you have to do a search, so mainly them how to prepare uh, medical missions, how to equip yourself, how to equip in medical uh, medicine uh, terms, in uh, medical equipment. You have to research of the potential medical issues you can face. Obviously, we discuss and we will talk uh, later about the Zika, but also the upper respiratory tract infection. There is a big problem in, uh, in teams. Jet lag, uh, Rio is six hours ahead of um, Qatar. So we, we, you have to prepare a little bit yourself. A very important thing is when you become a member of these beautiful missions is you have to abandon your ego and you have to be a, a, a team member. I remember these pictures are from the Atlanta 1996, probably almost 12 mi at midnight. So sometimes you have to be one member mass, more. You have to provide massage, you have to provide recovery as one of your masters or physiotherapists. And you have to forget about everything because uh, you stay as team physician. No, I don't do that. So probably you will be criticized and you are not uh, providing the spirit. It's just the other way around. So this is the people that uh, came to Qatar. There are some of them here in the audience. Thank you for coming. Like Andre, I saw him, you, and it was a very nice experience. Also, I, have, I saw Benito from uh, Humboldt. Thank you for coming. Uh, so uh, it was much less bigger than USA. Of course, as I said, we are 36 athletes, 55 uh, officers, but uh, we did our best for sure. So second question, probably some of you missed the first one. Sorry, you should have come earlier, but <laughs> still you have the possibility to select the second question, the, thing, the one you think that is the correct one. Okay, so. Um, so Juan, you are uh, clearly well, well trained for this role. What else was done particularly to prepare Team Qatar? Well, uh, when I took the mission, it was uh, late February. So all of a sudden, we had to prepare the list of medicines and medications that we had to provide before 28th uh, February. Unfortunately, we were overdue. We produced the list later, but the organizing committee accepted. And we had to produce then in February, we had to imagine what medicines we will need, what medical equipment uh, we will need to bring. And it was almost six months in advance, so it's a very, a lot of time to prepare these missions. And we decided uh, what to take, and our mission was trying to be autonomous, independent, not relying on the local organizing committee, because obviously, and then we will discuss later in a couple of slides, there is a unique situation in the Olympic Bella, but we prefer to be uh, independent. So we provide a lot of uh, stuff. We, I remember I brought myself with me nine pieces of material and I had to check in every single one and my wife here, <laughs> she was so uh, uh, kind to help me in the wrapping every single one to avoid any problems in the transportation. And also uh, we had to review the medical situations in uh, Rio. We already discussed on Sika. We will talk, come back to Sika um, later. We tried to vaccinate all the, mem all the members of the team. So we brought here most of the athletes and thanks uh, screening department, pharmacy, and uh, healthy lifestyle that helped us to bring the athletes to vaccinate. We only did uh, frequent traveler uh, vaccinations, typhoid, uh, tetanus, and hepatitis C, A, A, yes. And then uh, also we discussed with the Qatar Olympic Committee about the insurance. You have to be ready to provide good medical care and eventually repatriation when there is a very serious event. But during Olympics, there is a luxurious situation for many things. And one of them is that the local organizing committee together with IOC, they pay a full coverage insurance. So if you have a serious problem, you will be fully paid and the person will be repatriated home. So this was a unique situation. Uh, one of the things that we did is we discussed previously with the IOC and the organizing committee about some particularities in the villa uh, that also uh, allow us to uh, envisage what kind of material, what kind of stuff we have to bring ourselves. I think you and I, we had to go through WADA uh, website and do, uh, we did an online course to uh, review all the uh, WADA prohibited list 
the TUE system, the therapeutic use exemption procedures, and the no-needle policy. This question of the no-needle policy is that IOC uh, expects from the doctors to limit the intramuscular and most likely the intravenous in administration of any medicine to their real need situations. And uh, we had to declare every single time that we are using a needle. So we also distribute this information among the two doctors that came with us. And also we try to bring in here in Aspetar every single Qatar member. So 90% of them went through the pre-participation screening here in the hospital. So I think we did a good, good operation. Obviously, you have to be prepared of the local transportation in the city. The city is a huge one. There is a couple of Brazilian people here. They probably know much better than me than Rio. The airport is up in the northeast. Uh, the Olympic Villa was in the southeast. Uh, almost 25 kilometers of uh, very difficult traffic. Uh, there were three different uh, Olympic areas. Uh, we were in Barra, Barra, or Barra. Did I pronounce well, Brazilian guys? Barra. Baja. So that was the area where the Olympic Villa was uh, placed and uh, we were very close to some uh, competition, competition venues like, for instance, Hamol on swimming on judo, which was, was good for us for Qatar. Then we had Diodogo, that it was the shooting and the equestrian, a bit far, but good, good uh, high road, uh, no traffic at all because we was most, almost halted by the police. And then the Olympic Stadium for Athletics and the Copacabana for beach volley. This was the preparation for Qatar. But obviously, for instance, in Copacabana, also cycling and triathlon were held. And also a very important thing, uh, we tried to prepare to be uh, close to the transportation desk or quick. But it's very important because you are living within the villa. 50 minutes, 20 minutes away of the bus. You are every day is, is wasting 20, 40 minutes of your time. In the Olympics, sometimes the, the time is gold and you have to, to save time. So a, a very important thing I think we did is we requested the participation of some departments here, healthy lifestyle, uh, sport and science department, pharmacy and research, and we collected the updated uh, literature about the Zika, about the uh, upper respiratory tract infections, prevention, about jet lag, about the recovery, and we put together everything in a booklet that we uh, edited together with the Qatar Olympic Committee, we both in English and Arabic. So thanks to some of you, like Dr. Omar, that helped us to translate it from English to Arabic. And we distributed this to all the members, and it was very well received because it will provide very interesting information. And one of the things that we highlighted, uh, in addition to the jet lag, is this phenomenon. So going to the dining hall in the Olympic Villa, that is a very big temptation. So uh, you are going there, and you are having three different kitchens. You have Indian, Asiatic, you have uh, Halal, you have uh, European in Brazilian, and you are tempted to start to pick everything and to have a big tray full of food, so you have to be very careful with that. And we insisted very much in trying to avoid the situation. To see Kayas, I will say that we were a lot of, with a lot of concern, we were aware, we were al almost panicking, but then so far, not a single case has been recorded by the World Health Organization. So Maybe we talk too much, media exaggerated, but at the end, it wasn't that big problem. Although we had to take uh, into consideration the fact that could, we could face cases. And I remember every single uh, cold or running nose, I started to ask about uh, arthralgias or fever or conjunctivitis. Because you see that the uh, symptoms uh, of Zika dengue and Zikungunya, they are more, most of the same. So the only differential the symptom we can use is the conjunctivitis and the retroorbital pain. And, but thank God we didn't have any. So tell us, maybe tell me you say you did some different preparations we did in Team Qatar. Tell us. Well, actually, and you shared, uh, you shared with me at the games that, the wonderful handout. It was really, it was really excellent, uh, the handout that you guys created. So for Team USA, uh, clearly, actually, there's more similarities than there were differences. Uh, we had athletic medical history. We actually had a formalized electronic medical record. So all of the athletes, all 550, were entered on the electronic medical record before the games. So at the games, anywhere you had a computer, you could tra uh, pull up their previous information. Uh, the staff was educated on the electronic medical record. Supplies, just like you, were shipped months in advance. So you had to plan this, this, uh, 
this whole medical choices of what you're going to bring significantly advanced. We had athletic education or athlete education for Zika, water risks for both for drinking and for competition, DVT risks. I was involved with a number of different uh, meetings with athletes uh, and their coaches who had private meetings with a re representative from the Centers of Disease Control or one of the United States experts on Zika to say, here's what your risks are, here's what we think. And virtually every athlete did choose to continue to go to the Olympic Games despite some, some discussions, they all went. Um, the differences, uh, we started planning uh, uh, for the Olympic Games at the time the Olympic City was named. So when Rio was named as Olympic City, the United States actually already sent uh, people to Rio and started kind of looking after the city, figuring out those different issues of logistics, transportation, security, uh, uh, and then starting to liaison with American security, international security, and how that was going to be for our athletes. Uh, uh, the other unique thing that we did is we actually reserved uh, uh, several, uh, three different high performance centers. So what basically they would rent a, a part portion of a soccer club or part of the naval station, uh, a resort community, and in those they would say, okay, that's where wrestling and, 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 and uh, martial art activities were going to be. They would set up mats, and our athletes had a, always a place to practice and train on site, so they didn't have to necessarily wait for the Rio formal venues to practice with. Uh, the USOC also had a significant uh, a change probably about five, di five years ago in terms of how they were organized, and they organized uh, the entire Olympics all the athletes into silos. So you could be an endurance athlete, you could be a speed athlete, you could be a power athlete, and then within those silos there were nutritionists, psychologists, uh, all to try to improve performance. So they invested on performance uh, then to try to see, ultimately by counting medals, uh, how we ultimately would do. Personally, uh, I found uh, I'm going into this, this world of uh, Brazil and uh, I don't speak Portuguese, so uh, I put I translate onto my phone, which actually worked quite nicely. A couple times I got lost with uh, uh, taxi cab drivers, and just get, you speak into this, and it would speak. Uh, medical team building for the Team USA uh, uh, began with naming of the medical team, but actually begins. We actually send the entire medical team to the Pan American Games as kind of a testing ground, see how all of the uh, the, the professionals are going to work together. And if, actually, if you didn't make it past the Pan Ams, you might get fired and, and move, move along. Uh, uh, for me, they, I was also uh, took care of uh, the women's gymnastics team as well as the equestrian team. And the equestrians, which is not, I hadn't routinely taken care of equestrian, they flew me to uh, one of the championships just so I could meet the athletes, meet the owners, meet everybody. So at the Olympic Games, they weren't surprised with who, who was going to be taking care of them. Uh, certainly uh, uh, did all of that homework. Uh, uh, there was an education of the entire medical staff about Zika, water pollution, had a strong recommendation of don't drink the local water, just use bottled water, uh, and, and, and personal planning. The other, the other thing, you've talked about Zika and the overwhelming concern about Zika. Uh, one of the other concerns clearly was the competition water, particularly for sailing, for the open water uh, distance swimming, uh, uh, primarily because uh, of the risk of the sewage, 51% of the uh, uh, sewage is untreated and goes right into the bay. And so because of that, there were high viral counts, high bacterial counts, and everybody was very concerned about what was going to go on with that. And the, really the question was interesting is who makes the decision about whether that venue should stay? Because they actually had alternative venues in Rio. They were a distance away. There was more travel time to get there. They were safe for water, but they weren't as pretty. It wasn't downtown Rio. And so who made that decision that was really ultimately was a decision but with the IOC guidance, and it was the host country who said, no, I think we're safe to go. And in fact, like Zika, not, never really a problem. We didn't see any rashes. I had more psychological problems. A couple sailors actually inverted their boats, uh, and they came back to uh, the USA Medical and said, I, I need some of that as antibiotics. I need something crazy right now because I, I, I had two gulps of water, and I think I'm going to get really sick. Well, we said, well, let's wait and see how, what, what happens. Uh, the other thing that USA ha uh, did uh, was they used this uh, uh, poly uh, polymerase chain reaction uh, uh, machine from BioFire. This is a French, French company, Moreau. And uh, what we were able to do on site in our medical area, uh, if somebody had low-grade fever, the upper respiratory infection, we'd do a nasal swab. And within an hour, we knew exactly what they had whether they had a virus, a bacteria, if they had GI symptoms, diarrhea, we could then do, do those tests also. We knew exactly what they had, and therefore we could actually target the treatments. Uh, for us, that ultimately meant 
uh, that we would use less antibiotics and we could target our treatments uh, or isolate our athletes. Uh, some of the things that we saw, we saw a number of different cases of E. coli contamination uh, from local food intake, uh, and in those cases, uh, uh, they were treated with Zyfaxin and actually had, within 24 hours, very positive responses. We had some types of uh, neurovirus, basically very uh, highly contagious. However, it's, it's a virus, so they, these people were isolated. We had cases of uh, upper respiratory infections and actual influenza. Of course, having influenza go through an entire team of 550 athletes would be a nightmare. And so we, would, we isolated them. We, could, we had it actually a designed isolation room uh, so that if we had any of those problems, that athlete would be isolated. Uh, and we were able to make the diagnosis of flu again with this BioFire device. Uh, uh, we actually had uh, uh, some concerns uh, about uh, maybe somebody, actually in all honesty, that somebody was me, of being a vector because the isolation room was in my suite. So we had, an, we had a coach of athletics who had the flu, and I had three equestrian uh, 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 athletes or coaches with the flu. Of course, they're completely different, and the only thing that went between the two was this doctor. So they swabbed my nose too, and I didn't have the flu. So it, wa it wasn't me. Um, but uh, so we had early use of uh, uh, Zyfax and Tamiflu. We could target our treatments, uh, less use of uh, uh, antibiotics or azithromycin. Uh, so it was actually quite uh, uh, helpful. Clearly, uh, as we move on, the centerpiece of the athletic life during the games is the Olympic Village. There were some issues with the village, at least uh, in the news. Yeah. How about, did you guys uh, feel that? I think the that? whole uh, family, Olympic family, experienced the same problem. So it was a quite difficult uh, situation about the cleanliness, uh, the lack of uh, good cleaning. But I will first uh, highlight the privilege to all the team physicians working in Olympics. We had having the polyclinic in the Olympic Villa. Because we are certain that very few communities in the world we will be best served that the uh, Olympic family during the Olympics. Because you have one 24-7 uh, emergency ward with a radiology uh, service with two magnets from General Electric, that is uh, official sponsor for uh, IOC, one three Teslas uh, magnet, another 1.5 Teslas magnet, a radiography, uh, ultrasound, uh, laboratory, dentistry, ophthalmology, all uh, from nine to nine, the pharmacy, uh, anything else on request. So we use uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, consultations, surgery, dermatology, and we were provided that on request on transfer to a local and close uh, community hospital. So it's a really huge privilege, privilege to, to work in the Olympics because you have tools that you probably will never dream in to have at home. So it's a very interesting thing. Obviously, there are some issues, and uh, we, we would like to highlight this. So it's a good opportunity also for physiotherapy. The physiotherapy service at Olympics was huge. So there were ice baths, there were plenty of uh, treatment rooms, a huge um, team of physiotherapists, chiropractors, osteopaths, things like that. Also, there was an orthopedic uh, service with, uh, from uh, one uh, German company. Uh, splints, things like that, on, on customized uh, orthotics. So it was uh, impressive, really impressive. Uh, also, when you are preparing your uh, area of work, you have to do discuss with the local organizing committee that they provide most of the things. So you will have tables, you will have separators and partitions, you will have um, the tables, but uh, sometimes you have to bring uh, stupid things or not that stupid things like uh, Binders, AC folders, uh, scotch, uh, pens, because you have to do some uh, clerical work there, so you have to be prepared. So that is making your uh, pieces and your luggage bigger and uh, weight and bigger and bigger. So it was a good opportunity. I think that the most important problem we face, as, as I said, is the lack of cleanliness. So elevator systems, lobbies were not clean well enough, the rooms were not clean in enough. The lining was not changed. The, uh, we had to take the lining, go to the Olympic service area and ask for new linen because they was not changed, the towels, things like that. So it was a bit difficult situation sometimes. But what I would like to highlight also that is even in our small team that we have only for the 36 uh, athletes, 39 uh, medical encounters during the whole uh, competition, very few compared to your 5,000 treatments. 
um, the most important aspect was uh, upper respiratory tract infection. Even that we distributed hand sanitizers to every single uh, athlete to uh, sprays of this, and thanks uh, to Dr. Roger Pat Freeman and help us to get them. By the way, I forget to mention that we distributed two sprays of DEET for uh, trying to, to prevent from the uh, mosquito bites. So we tried to do our best in both sides, but uh, upper respiratory tract infection was an issue anyway. So third question, please fill uh, the, in your forms and pick the one that you think is the right answer. I am afraid that most of you missed the first and some of you even the second, but as I said, please, you should have come earlier. Okay, then um, tell us some of your challenges in the team you say. What things did you face that were a little bit difficult? Yeah, so we, we had actually uh, similar types of uh, issues. Uh, I think which we had to realize was the, they had built 28 18-story buildings. They're brand new just for our use. And so every building is going to have a break-in time and have some issues. So we had our elevator issues. We had uh, cleanliness issues uh, 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 also. Fortunately, we have the, uh, the advantage of we actually had one building all, of, all to ourselves, And in that building, uh, we had our problems, but we actually then brought in our own people. We actually brought in people from the United States just to reorganize the laundry service so it would be more efficient. Uh, we had building maintenance, uh, hang uh, shower curtains, uh, extend beds, do other different things to, uh, to make it ready for our athletes. Uh, we did use the poly clinic. Uh, uh, like you did, we were very selective about its use. We were very uh, proud to be uh, independent, like you guys uh, did, and so our medical area was quite independent. We tended to use the polyclinic for its imaging uh, when we needed occasional consultation and, and then the pharmacy. We did bring our own uh, extended pharmacy, but we tended to use their pharmacy because it was really quite good and quite efficient. The buildings actually, again, un un not really completely red or didn't have fire extinguishers. So we went out and bought uh, uh, probably 50 different fire extinguishers to put, a put around our building uh, for athlete safety. Most popular uh, uh, service at the polyclinic? Best guess? Massage. Massage, yeah, probably commonly used. The one that was, had the longest waiting list was always filled was dental because the third world uh, didn't, doesn't have dental access. And so they would come and maybe they, they wanted to compete at the Olympic Games, but they weren't even gonna be in the medal, so they took time to go to dental and get their teeth checked and such. Uh, for us, uh, in terms of the uh, physios and, and athletic trainers, uh, one of the lessons that I learned is to be smart. Be complete during the treatments, but don't over-treat. Uh, an example would be one of our equestrian athletes who said, oh my gosh, you mean, Beyond our own uh, 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 massage therapist, there's massage therapists by the USOC. I'm going to go get a massage there and get a massage from our guy. And then when they get in the saddle, they're kind of all floppy instead of nice and, uh, and, and taut. So you have to be careful about doing some of that over-treatment with musculoskeletal. Just as uh, uh, Juan Manuel said, uh, you have to be open-minded as you go as one of the doctors because there's all kinds of other things to do. Oftentimes, as the medical doctor, you guys had a, a limited number of, of, of injuries. In all honesty, as an orthopedic surgeon, I didn't do any surgery when I was in Rio, okay? <laughs> and so I had to be willing to do all kinds of other different things. In fact, we put extended, uh, extend, help, help do the extensions on the bed. Uh, I hung buckets in the equestrian stalls uh, when the horses were ready to come in. If you're a primary care doctor, you have to be willing to be uh, really good at your musculoskeletal examination and skills. If you're an orthopedic surgeon going, you better be ready to do your regular doctor skills. Take care of the runny noses, take care of the upper respiratory infections, because that by far was the biggest thing that we saw. In fact, sometimes you had to be the escort or the witness uh, 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 for uh, uh, when somebody had to do drug testing. Uh, by Juan the Manuel. way, Qatar is, was only selected once in Hamburg, so and, and I, I, I wasn't uh, forced to escort any of our And I had to go four or five times, but part of that was because, in all honesty, I think they, if, it's, if it's random, it's not random. If you were on the medal stand, you got tested. Uh, here's the picture of uh, Team USA's area. Uh, we actually set it up so we had kind of an area in the front where they'd get basic treatment. We'd go farther back. There was a little doctor's area. And then way back in the back behind that door was a very private area. And so sometimes if you had, uh, we'll say, a professional basketball player or a professional tennis player that really didn't want to be in the mix, then we would take them in the way back for a, a nice little private, uh, private area. 
Beyond this medical footprint, we actually had a separate footprint that was just for uh, that, the performance uh, and recovery. So that's where the massage therapists were, hot cold plunges, game ready, Normatec, which was actually quite nice because for our athletes, sometimes go, coming into medical, they go, well, I don't really want to tell anybody I'm sick. I just want to get ready for the next day tomorrow. So they were very comfortable going into the uh, recovery area. We had a protected zone just for the athletes, that is to say, there was a, a lounge that they could go to, no coaches went to, no doctors went to, they could just relax. There was a team nutritionist who monitored the cafeteria, supplied snacks that, that were healthy that they would have available to them. We had sports psychology and athlete ombudsman available 24-7 in case you might have some uh, crazy swimmer that got in trouble at night and needed help. I don't know who that might be, but, but we had that available to them. Medical challenges for Team USA, like you guys, most common complaint in Rio was upper respiratory, infect, uh, upper respiratory complaints, congestion, mild sore throat, post-nasal drip. Personally, I believe it was mostly environmental. I think it was kind of the dust and stuff in the community that triggered that. Could be viral, it was, it was not bacterial because the stuff that we tested was very rarely that was the issue. Uh, when we tested it with the BioFire, uh, they had to have a fever, then that's when we had some of those issues. For us, if they had a fever, uh, we checked them with BioFire and then went on, went on. A few other unique medical challenges that we faced because we had uh, quite a variety of different things that we would face. I had a, I had a coach uh, who in the morning, we talked about being safe with your water. Get, dr don't drink the local water. Well, he actually had his water bottle. He would take a couple gulps of his water uh, uh, to, with his morning pills and it tasted like bleach. He thought he was poisoned. Everybody's worried about security. He thought he was poisoned. I'm poisoned. Well, what ultimately happened was one of the cleaning ladies had diluted her bleach, left her bottle on the thing, and he, that's what he drank. Fortunately, he was okay. Uh, pink eye in a rower certainly is a, a, a concern because uh, these are going to be contagious within the team. So you have to isolate them, hand washing, uh, try to treat them uh, so that they don't contaminate everybody else. We had one of our lead medical staff, after working really hard, so you, know, you don't turn yourself off. You're working 24-7. And he got up from a sitting, and he was like tilted to the left. I mean, he had lost his balance. I personally thought he was going to, I thought he was having a stroke. Uh, fortunately, whatever that acute dizziness was, rest, observation, he was able to resolve. But that message is we have to take care of ourselves. As the doctors, we have to look out for ourselves because you do put in long hours, and so you have to give everybody breaks. Migraines, uh, we've had a, we had a few of these. And one of the interesting things, we had a colonel uh, in the military who did, uh, did uh, 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 military type of medicine. So he had these auricular asks. Now you may say, I'm, now I'm talking acupuncture, I'm talking crazy things. I'm a, I'm a watcher, I'm an observer. I'm, I'm gonna look at the skill sets of everybody, everybody but of our team and see what I can learn. We had three people come in with migraine headaches. He actually did this auricular ask, attack these things there. I will tell you, I just witnessed it. Two out of three, immediately their headache was gone. And, and I, I kind of ignore the doctors in these situations. I look right at the athletes and go, how do you feel? They go, pain that is gone. So I was, I was amazed at the potential uh, of that. We had concussions uh, 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 in a few different athletes. Uh, this one was a, a kayak athlete who inverted his boat, got upside down, broke his paddle, couldn't, get up, couldn't right himself, hit his head on a rock, and uh, had, a, had a headache, started getting better with his headache. We checked his eye, extra, extra, uh, extraocular muscles and I go up and down and look at all four corners and he was fine. But interestingly, the chiropractor uh, who comes in, he goes, let me check him. Because we all did everything as a team, so we had everything double checked. And he did quick ocular motions into the corners and then you could see this nice, this nice diagnosis. And so we waited for him until his nice diagnosis resolved and he had no headache. But really the question was, is who disqualifies an Olympian at the Olympic Games? If you have a concussion, in my program at the university, I'm the guy. They have a concussion, they're out of play for till no symptoms, I stress them, I rehab them before they go back. At the Olympic Games, it's kind of a team thing, it's really up to the athlete uh, whether that they feel safe to go back. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity, so it's difficult. We had a few cases of uh, abrasions and blisters, this could happen with anybody, so you just want to have good skin care. This one I just kind of say is a little bit crazy for a team, 550, you think you want to compete for all these different medals at the Olympic Games, and this was our opening ceremony shoes. So everybody's wearing these brand new shoes. And this is what we have, uh, uh, you know, three, four days after opening ceremonies. We have blisters. And so we, we're trying to protect the athletes with taping and stuff before them. I personally say, I got to tell everybody from in the future, our athletes, when they walk into opening ceremonies, 
they're going to wear nice, comfortable tennis shoes or something cushy because I'm not sure why I'm risking their feet <laughs> with uh, these fancy shoes. Had an interesting uh, patient with a shoulder instability and spasm, uh, uh, true instability, uh, a lot of pain, wanted an injection, uh, wanted me to, what called me and said, I want to, you to give me an injection at the Olympic Games. No needle policy. I'm no a little concerned policy. about what we're supposed to do. She gets a TUE, gets an injection somewhere else. Didn't work very well. Uh, and our physical therapist did dry needling. Amazing relief because I think her pain was because of spasm, periscapular spasm. So the dry needling stopped the periscapular spasm and she was able to compete. We had a shooting athlete who, not during, not during activities, but during our, our uh, in, in the buildings, uh, she actually had a curtain, but she, she slipped on the slippery floor, had a recurrent history of patellar dislocations, dislocated her patella. We were able to reduce it, tape it, and fortunately, she was not a big twisting and cutting athlete, and she was able to get back to uh, compete and meddled. Uh, I actually had the pleasure uh, years ago of serving with uh, uh, the, the, the rhythmic team in 1996. Repetitive problem, maybe in this sport, and maybe in any sport that over, has overtraining, and that was stress fractures uh, uh, because of some of the eating issues probably that goes with the sport, but probably uh, because of overtraining, and it happened both years. Here's actually a heptathlete who had uh, a stress fracture in the distal tibia. Uh, somebody actually tried to put screws across it. Actually, I don't necessarily agree with this treatment, but somebody tried to do this. Fourth question of the series of the Olympic trivia. Try to pick the right answer. So, uh, what are the highest risks in the sport, in uh, sports risks in the Olympics? Uh, well, if we take into consideration the published literature, uh, the IOC Olympic uh, group already published, and they say soccer and taekwondo. So, you have uh, female soccer, we didn't have soccer, unfortunately, and we didn't have taekwondo. Uh, so, we had to concentrate in other sports. You had the open water swimming, the problem with the water swimming, open water swimming was this uh, contamination of the open waters. Equestrian obviously is a high risk, although the incidences are not that high. In, but you have a, an injury, you have an incident, it would be a, a serious one. So uh, another thing that you have to be aware of here, here that you just had a nice uh, injury during the actual event. Uh, actually, you're not done being a doctor until basically you've flown all the way home. I know that with Team USA, they tell me that uh, uh, even on the flight home, I'm responsible for all the athletes, so it's not until we land that we're, I'm off the hook. This was an interesting thing that even during, this is actually during the medal ceremony uh, during the equestrian event. They actually come in on the horses, they get off the horses to receive their medals. You have the, uh, the, the groom uh, escorting the, the horse in. Everybody cheers, which scares the horse, and the horse kicks him in the head. So he goes down. People ultimately, uh, uh, medical responds. He ultimately did have a laceration and a concussion, uh, but you have to be ready all the time. And as we kind of uh, uh, wind down our talk, this is an interesting, uh, uh, Andreas Tobus is a, a German uh, uh, a gymnast who actually went down and tore his ACL. And he actually continued to compete after he tore his ACL just so that his team could try to get to the next level of competition. So with that, uh, as we kind of wind down our, our, our talk, did you have any Olympic moment? For me, an Olympic moment is that special moment that is even beyond just being at the Olympic Games. It really meant the Olympics to you. So also it's a very interesting thing that during Olympics, even your family get inspired to do interesting things related to Olympics. So even my father, he wanted to flame his, to light his flame at his uh, nursery home. Okay, so the fifth and last but not least question. Now we will see all the responses. Your oh, and, and so I just want to share a couple of different. For me, Olympic moments aren't necessarily always about the gold medal, although that world record was impressive. And actually, I did get to go to Michael Phelps's last race. Uh, but I, I'll share a couple of different things. This is an interesting. He's an uh, Olympic rower who came into me uh, before competition. He comes with his head down, comes into medical, and he goes, "I have a problem." And we go, please come, come sit, what, what's your problem? And he puts up his hand and he says, uh, my wristband broke. 10 days prior he uh, had his first baby and he wanted to row with that. So my job as the doctor was actually to, to, to duct tape his, uh, his uh, uh, band back on so he could compete. And he was very proud of that. But probably my best, my best Olympic moment is this one. This is uh, 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 Abby D'Agostino 
who actually had a pelvic stress fracture prior to the games. She called me uh, before the games because she had been training on an Ultra G machine and wondered if there was one at the games that she could continue training so she could go. So looking back, Zika was not particularly a problem that we thought it would be. We saw no particular issues with poor competition, with water quality. Uh, Pre-games focus on performance produced a most successful uh, metal performance, uh, 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 actually a third most in history for the U.S. Uh, there's no I in team. We needed to be positive and flexible. And then we had multiple opportunities to really celebrate our patriotism. Okay, I think you are running short of time. So uh, just to summarize that the most important thing is when you're going there, do a good preparation, take your time, research on literature, prepare yourself, prepare the team, be a team member, and also try to enjoy. Once you are there, you are privileged, you are honored, everybody's uh, inviting you because you are there in the Olympics. And also, of course, you have the opportunity to celebrate your country uh, victories and performances. So, and sometimes you celebrate your adopted countries. <laughs> so this is, this is, you can see Juan, Ma Juan Manuel and I with Team Qatar uh, after uh, leaving the equestrian village. So we were very proud of, I, I was very proud of this moment. It was really kind of fun time to kind of gather together. And we were lucky to have Sehal Thani there that performed outstandingly that day. Oh, actually, uh, he was amazing. Actually, I, I told you my Olympic moment, but if, if you weren't there, uh, there was another great Olympic moment. It was all about him. And that was uh, while he competed, he actually got the entire crowd behind him because the equestrian is kind of a, this kind of a, okay, we're kind of a really official type of a thing. <laughs> After he finished his, ra his, his run, he was very proud and everybody was very cheered because his emotion was in him. So it was very yeah. uh, impressive. So I would like to acknowledge every single of you that came, all departments in the hospital, you have to be proud because the whole hospital was behind us. Uh, it's a very unique situation. I prepared other Olympics and didn't have the support I had when I prepared Rio, 19, Rio 2016. And just to give you a comment, one of our colleagues that were also chief medical officer told me, hey, Juan Manuel, you are super lucky because I am begging literally to the pharmaceutical companies and to the sport medicine companies to provide us supply. And you have everything in hospital. So I probably will miss some names. Don't consider this personal. I want to acknowledge every single of you, your participation. You have to be proud to be a member of hospital. So now the time of the questions, the correct questions. So Qatar participated for the first time in Los Angeles in 1984. That's number B, correct? Who got that, an who, who got that answer right? <laughs> Le leave your Good. hand up. Leave your hand up. I want to see if uh, so going to win. So how it. many medals Qatar won? Five. They won five. The last one, this competition by uh, Bursa Mat M Bar Barsi Mutas that also won in London. In London, World, we, have, we had another one in Sutin. Two in Barcelona, in weightlifting and uh, athletics, and one in, in Seoul. So who was the Olympic, uh, Olympian with most appearances? Anybody? The right answer. So a Canadian equestrian guy that participated 10 times in the Olympics. Can you imagine? 10 consecutive times. So almost 40 years competing. Amazing. So this was a bit tricky because uh, I put uh, wrongly some numbers, so I tried to confuse you. So the question is, who won more medals? Of course, F Michael Phelps won more medals, but he won 28, not 25. So the correct answer of this is 12, because Usain Bolt won nine or eight, because probably one of his medals will be a strip because of doping of one of his mates. So uh, the number five. Uh, when USA won more medals, it was back in 1904 in San Luis, 2039. Then the B is wrong because it was um, LA, not Atlanta, in 84, uh, with that number of medals, 184, 74. And then in Rio de Janeiro, it's 1 to 121. So this was everything. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming over.